My name is Todd Golub. And I'm Justin Lamb. With our collaborators here at the Broad, we've developed what we call the connectivity map. What we're trying to do with the connectivity map is to apply the power of genomics in a way that could make significant impact on the way we discover drugs. That process historically has been a very ad hoc one, where there haven't been ways to systematically figure out what it is that a particular drug actually does inside a cell, or figuring out ways to determine for a particular disease what drugs are there that might best treat it. The basic idea of the connectivity map is to say, OK, these are two domains, meaning disease and chemistry, that look very, very different. The people who participate in them are very, very different. You know, there's physicians on this side and those hard-nosed organic chemists on this side. They can't interact because they speak different languages. And so the idea of the connectivity map is to find a common language that both biologists and chemists can use and understand, and use this common language to establish connections that we didn't previously know about. The language we chose is what's called the gene expression profile of a cell. Every cell in your body has the same set of genes, about 20 to 25,000 of them. The reason you've got many very different types of cell is that each cell type turns on or expresses a different set of those genes. This cell expresses this handful of genes at these levels, and this one expresses a different handful of genes at different levels. I shouldn't say handful, right? Because that sounds like a low number. But you know, this bucket of genes and this bucket of genes are expressed at different levels. Just as different genes are turned on and off in different cell types, so different genes are expressed in disease cells than in normal cells. And that pattern of which genes are turned on or off is the gene expression signature of that disease. Some of the machines we use to read a cell's gene expression signature are on display in this exhibit. You can listen to Stacy Gabriel describe how the signatures emerge from the machines in the form of an extremely complex two-dimensional barcode. The analogy with barcodes, you know, on your groceries is a good one. You go and you buy, I don't know, coffee or something, and there's a barcode on there. You've got no idea what that barcode is. By looking at the barcode, you couldn't tell it was coffee. But if you go to the checkout and the guy scans it, he's got some way of interpreting those lines into coffee, and it's $11.99 if you buy the good stuff or something, right? So you know, the gene expression profile, although it probably explains the disease in some way we can't interpret, it's a barcode for the disease. Well, just as a disease has a genomic barcode, so does a drug. If you take a cell in the laboratory and treat it with a drug, some genes stay the same, some genes go up, and some genes go down. And so if we can describe diseases and drug action in the same kind of language, the language of which genes get turned on and off, now all of a sudden we can see connections between diseases and drugs because we can see the similarity in these signatures. The genius of the connectivity map is that there is no genius, right? It's actually very, very simple. And in many ways, by making dumb choices, making executive decisions, just saying, OK, this is not really that hard, let's do something simple, it turns out to work well. We've already profiled many of the 1,314 drugs approved by the FDA. One of the things we hope to do with the connectivity map is find new uses for some of those existing drugs. In fact, we're already discovering that there are drugs that induce multiple different signatures in a cell. Maybe the drug was developed with a particular signature in mind, but now we're finding that drugs that have been available at the drugstore for years are activating signatures we never knew about, suggesting that these drugs may have new uses. A nice example comes from a collaboration with Scott Armstrong, a pediatric oncologist at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He's spent a good portion of his career trying to figure out why about half of his patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia are essentially cured by a drug called dexamethasone, while the other half of his patients, he can give them this drug and nothing happens. The drug doesn't work. And so it occurred to us that we could make a signature of dexamethasone sensitivity by comparing the tumor cells from patients that are sensitive to the tumor cells from patients that are resistant. So we got a list of genes that represent the dexamethasone sensitivity signature. And then we reasoned, well, if we could find some other drug that induced a cell to turn on that signature of dexamethasone sensitivity, maybe it would actually make the cell sensitive. And so we took that signature and compared it to all the signatures in the connectivity map database and said, does anything look like this signature? And the map said, yes, there's one drug, a known drug that's already FDA approved and used in the clinic for something else called serolimus, also known as rapamycin. So Scott went back to the lab where he has all the reagents to do these experiments very, very quickly and showed that indeed if you treated dexamethasone resistant cells with dexamethasone plus rapamycin, they would now be killed to a degree greater than had ever been seen before. And because rapamycin is already FDA approved, it was immediately obvious to suggest that you could use that combination clinically. And he's now enrolling patients in a clinical trial to test that novel combination. At the same time as we were working our way through the FDA approved drugs, 
we're also looking at chemicals that are being created for the first time being synthesized at the Broad. And those are very interesting because these are molecules that no one's ever seen before. It's not obvious to know how to actually figure out what they do. One way to figure this out is to make a signature of them. I'd hope that in five years, say, the database is 100 times more data than it does now, and that interacting with the connectivity map becomes a routine part of doing biomedical research. Todd's likened the connectivity map to Google. It's actually very much the same. But rather than type in a word or a phrase in that little box, you essentially type in a list of genes differentially expressed in a piece of biology that you care about. You click one button, and now you're presented with a rank-ordered list of chemicals ranked by their similarity to the list of genes that you uploaded in the first place. So I think the analogy is quite strong. And also because it's free, it's quick, it happens in real time, and you can do it from anywhere. And it's good fun to do, right?